So all of this discussion of constitutive modeling uh, has been because we're trying to, remember, we're trying to close the problem in conservation of momentum in that we need a relationship between displacements and stress, and we use the strain as an intermediate quantity, uh, but you know, ultimately then this is the closure relationship. This is the constitutive model for an elastic material, and it's called generalized Hooke's law. So we know that stress is a tensor and strain is a tensor, so that thing in the middle also has to be a tensor. And in general, it's a fourth order tensor. And the fourth order tensor has 81 components. Okay. But if we make assumptions about planes of symmetry, uh, we can reduce that number drastically. We can actually just, uh, without, before I write anything else, So if we write, and I'm going to use some tensor notation here. Uh, I guess maybe let me let me. This is equivalent to saying the sum over k sum over L, where these go from 1 to 3, C, I, J, K, L. So uh, I and J and K and L all go from 1 to 3. Right? And so that, that top um, equation is just a shorthand way to write the equation below it. And this is due to Einstein, actually. So we call this Einstein notation. And in it, the way you sort of know what the sum is over is any indice that's repeated. So if you see in this term, any term is like any product, right? So this is a multiplication. And any term that has a repeated indice, so you see the k is repeated and the l is repeated, that means that's an implied summation. I won't test you on this. Anything related to this notation, but just in case you ever see it, that's, that notation is due to Einstein. Well, anyway, the point I was going to make is that we already know that the stress tensor is symmetric and the strain tensor is symmetric. So I can actually, because they're symmetric, I could transpose the I and the J and the K and the L. And just due to those, uh, and then it turns out that there's something special about C as well. And that I can transpose, I mean, obviously I can transpose the I and the J, and I can transpose the K and L, but I can also transpose the I and J together and the K and L together. So I could write that K, L, I, J, and that would be also a valid statement. And so just due to those symmetries, uh, we can reduce the 81 components of C to Thirty twenty-one. Twenty-one. What am I doing? Twenty-one. We can reduce it to twenty-one. So it a material that's fully anisotropic could potentially have twenty-one elastic constants. Which means to characterize that material, you have to go do twenty-one tests in the laboratory, right, just for one material. Right, but thankful thankfully most materials have planes of symmetry and you can reduce it further. Uh, so that you have materials that are like transversely isotropic, things like that. Um, wood, I think this is just the wood laminate, but nevertheless, wood is, a, is, a, is generally a transversely isotropic material. Right? So it's, it's stronger, if I were to pull on it you know, along the grain, it's stronger in that direction uh, than it would be if I were to pull on it against the grain in this direction. However, if I pull on it against the grain in this direction, it's the same strength as if I were to pull it on it against the grain over here. That would be a, an example of a transversely isotropic material. Um, but anyway, if you 
assume infinite planes of symmetry and material is purely isotropic, then you can characterize it with just two constants. And it doesn't matter which two. Uh, we'll see that there are several that ways to write it. Um, but if you exploit the symmetry of the stress and strain tensor so that you leave off the symmetric components, so now we've, we've converted the, the tensor, which has nine components, into a vector which only has six. So these are the six unique ones. And the way you always order them, this is called Voigt notation. So if we have a stress tensor, it's like sigma 1, 1, sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3. I'm just going to leave these out because those are symmetric. When you write when you write down uh, the stress in this vector form, the Voigt, no Voigt notation, you always write the diagonals first, and then you write those like in that order. So one one two two three three, and then one two one three two three. Uh, when you do that, then you can write the C. Again, instead of a tensor, you can write it in, in terms of this six by six matrix. And here we've chosen to only express them in terms of Young's modulus and Poisson rate. Right. But if you remember when we talked about definitions, there were other moduli, right? There was a bulk modulus, there was a shear modulus. And all of those things are related to each other if material is isotropic. So you can choose any two you want. Right. And depending on why you choose one over the other, I mean, it, it's likely when you go to the lab and measure, you're going to measure Young's modulus and for sure in one of the other ones. Probably Poisson ratio because the, the nice thing about um, you can actually, with one specimen, measure the um, Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio at the same time. And the way you would do that in the lab You, you almost always, you know, to, to get different material properties, you have to design different experiments that probe each behavior in isolation, right? But in this case, uh, with just an additional measurement, you can get uh, the two quantities at once. So, for example, if you had a, a lot of times, a common specimen to do tensile tests on are called dog bone specimens. They kind of look like that, like a dog bone. So if you were to um, pull on this guy, and if you pull on it, you measure the force on a load cell on the test apparatus, right? You know the cross-sectional area there. Force divided by area gives you stress, right? You can measure the strain by, or you can get the engineering strain by measuring the, the, the displacements of the ends. Again, that's usually on the load cell, right? So you measure the displacements of the ends. That gives you an idea of change in length divided by the original length. You got strain. So you get you can get stress and strain, uh, plot them, measure the slope. That's Young's modulus, right? And you can get that just from measurements that are on the load cell. However, if you were to place actually a strain gauge on the sample. One, in the, one that measures strain in the, in the vertical direction, also one place a second strain gauge on the sample that measures strain in the horizontal direction. Then you can, now you have two local strain measurements and you remember the Poisson ratio was like sigma one, uh, sigma one one over sigma three three, right, so the negative of that. But that was the definition of Poisson ratio. So you can actually, in one test, you could get Young's modulus and Poisson ratio. One test, but you need additional measurements. So that's, those are probably the most common that you'd measure. But if you can measure the shear modulus, if you can measure the bulk modulus, you can also use those to determine what the other coefficients are.
Uh, well, one way is to, I mean, actually, the assumption of isotropy in, in, in rocks is just always wrong. In any sedimentary rock, it's always wrong. Um, even in very sort of nice materials like steel, we often think uh, the steel is an isotropic material. But that assumption is almost always wrong as well. Uh, because just the way that steel, say, plates are made, they're rolled, typically. And the rolling direction will induce uh, just the, 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 the way when, it, when it's rolled, without trying to get into a whole material science conversation uh, about the grain structure of a, of a, of a cold rolled steel. But nevertheless, uh, there's, some, there's some work hardening things that happen during the rolling process that induces some isotropic, anisotropic. However, it's, it's usually pretty small. And so as an engineer, we, we just decide to ignore it and treat it as an isotropic material. Okay? Um, so there's a lot of that that goes on, is that we sort of know there's some anti anisotropy, but we, s we say, well, of all the other things we don't know, uh, that's not an important factor. Okay? So we just be engin we're engineers, and we, we make that determination a priori. If you don't know anything about the material at all, and you, you need to, you know, you, you say you're, you're saying everything's important, I need to know everything, right? Then the only way to do it is to do tests, right? So you, you'd have to test the material. Like if you're talking about a rock, you, you, you'd test it in a, with an orientation where you'd make cores with an orientation that's parallel to the bedding plane and perpendicular, right? And you'd test both those and measure, do measurements, right? And if they turn out to be the same, then you'd, which would never be the case, but then you'd say, okay, these are isotropic and then you could eliminate that. The only way to know for sure is to, te is to test it. Though. So given that there are multiple ways or you know, for an isotropic material, which is really all we'll deal with in this class, e even though I just said rocks are never isotropic, just for the sake of simplicity, we'll, only, we'll assume everything is isotropic in this class. And given that there are sort of other parameters we can use, there's, there are more compact ways to write these equations uh, such that possibly, you know, it'd be kind of difficult to, to memorize this thing, right? I, I have it. You know, if you asked me to write that down, I'd have to look it up. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't, have, don't have that memorized. However, I do have... Um, couple of these more sim simple forms memorized. So you can write things very compactly in the matrix notation like this uh, using the bulk and shear moduli. So we have a definition for volumetric strain. So we can just say that the bulk modulus times the volumetric strain times the identity matrix plus 2G. And this is something that we call sometimes the deviatoric strain. So if the volumetric strain is a material's, you know, the, the strain that um, changes volume of the material, then the thing associated with shear, which would cause shape changes, another word for that is the deviatoric strain. So the deviatoric strain is like the total strain minus the average volume of the volumetric strain. Uh, and, and so, you know, this is a, a simple way to write that using, using parameters that um, that you you know we've defined the, the bulk and shear modulus, and you know the relationship between this and, and that is that you know the shear modulus is also just the Young's modulus over two times one plus the Poisson ratio because they're all related for an isotropic material, and there's even a, a, a simpler way to write it. Uh, I don't know what that two is right there what that is, but <laughs> oh, I think it's just the definition of lambda. So there's, there's an even simpler way to write it in that there's this lambda, which is something called the Lemay's parameter, and it's the volumetric strain times I plus 2G times the total strain. So this is the one I always memorize for an isotropic material. I know this one for sure, and, and, and this one. I could memorize this one. Um, because it's just much easier to write compactly like that. So then lambda is l something called Lemay's parameter, and it's not something we measure in the sense of like 
I couldn't tell you how to go to the lab and measure lambda. But lambda is just related to some of the other constants. So I can, you can go to the lab and measure those constants and, and determine what lambda is. So then this is the, a table of relationships between the elastic constants. Um, obviously, no one in the whole world could memorize that whole table. Uh, and the way you read this is, if you're given two, right? So if you're given Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, and you want to know lambda, well then that's then you look up there, but, you know, under the lambda column, that's the relationship. So the the two you're given are over here, and the one you would want to find out is up there. And again. K is bulk modulus, E is Young's modulus, lambda is Lemay's parameter, G is shear modulus, V is Poisson ratio. Or that's actually mu. So, uh, sometimes um, Young's modulus is almost always E, like that's ubiquitously the symbol. Bulk modulus is almost always K. Uh, Poisson ratio is almost always mu. The the one that's sort of Sometimes different is people will use um, mu. Like, um, in case my uh, Texas accent is obfuscating my Greek, uh, this I'm calling mu. Uh, this is mu. Um, and so sometimes you'll see the shear modulus with this symbol. But I don't like to use it in this class or even in any kind of petroleum engineering uh, sort of literature or field because you know we often talk about fluids. Uh, we have fluid viscosity in our Darcy's law, and we often use that symbol for that. So, so that's why it's G here. But uh, so you can you can find these con these uh, tables on like Wikipedia. You can just Google you know uh, elastic constant relationships. It'll probably take you to the Wikipedia page, and you'll find these constants. And this is even all of them. Uh, there's more. Um, I think well, maybe they're going off the screen there. But anyway, uh, the one we haven't talked about at all is this M. This is the seismic modulus. So this is the this is defined like this. So when you go do uh, you know in seismic, you have your your P wave velocity and your S wave velocity. And so if you were to measure those sound speeds, uh, then the relationship between the sound speed and the density, which is easy to get, this uh, M would be this, this value. Right here. So that's, you know, uh, elasticity. The idea again, elast the elast elasticity is a constitutive model that relates stresses to strains, and then we now have a mathematical definition that let rates relate strains to displacements, and so we can plug all that back into the conservation momentum equation, and we have a closed problem that we can solve for displacements. 